Hello, and welcome to your lecture on the Phoenicians and the Greeks. Grab your student notes and use them to follow along and fill in any blanks that you missed in class. The fall of major civilizations during the Bronze Age collapse of 1250 to 1150 BC opened up a power vacuum in the Near East and Eastern Mediterranean for other powers to grow and thrive. One of these was the Phoenicians, whose name means the Purple People. Phoenician civilization dates back to 3200 BC and lasts until about 332 BC. However, it was between the years 1500 and 332 BC that they really thrived. The land of the Phoenicians, Phoenicia, was located in the Levant in modern day Lebanon. Now before the Bronze Age collapse, the Levant was owned by ancient Egypt and hotly contested by the Hittites. It was a battleground sometimes, but after these major powers fell or diminished during the Bronze Age collapse, the Phoenicians had the ability to claim this territory for their own and room to grow and gain power. You'll notice that most of the territory of the Phoenicians borders the sea. So it's no surprise the Phoenicians became expert sailors. They were famous across the Mediterranean for their shipbuilding and sailing ability, and they're credited with many important inventions in the art of shipbuilding. One of these inventions was the keel, this bottom part of the boat that enables the boat to stay upright in the water. They also invented the battering ram on the bow, which they often coated with bronze, the better to ram your enemies with. But whether in battle or just in the normal course of sailing, you don't want water coming between the planks of your ship, so the Phoenicians also invented caulking between the planks. Despite their invention of the battering ram on the bow, the Phoenicians were not a warlike people. Their natural defenses, the sea on one side, mountains on the rest, meant that they didn't have to worry about attack as much as other peoples did. Instead, they were able to put all of their efforts into becoming the best businessmen that the Mediterranean had ever seen. As this map of their trade route shows, the Phoenicians traded across the Mediterranean, but they didn't stop there. They voyaged as far as the Indian Ocean on one side and ancient Britain on the other. There's even some very scanty evidence that they might have made it all the way across the Atlantic Ocean. In fact, this ship, which is a replica of a Phoenician ship from 600 BC, was sailed using traditional methods not only all around the notoriously difficult coast of Africa, but even across the Atlantic Ocean. The Phoenicians used their far-flung voyages to get exotic goods to sell to the people back home, but they had goods of their own to sell as well. Phoenician wood was in high demand. The cedars of Lebanon were famous for both their quality and their scent, and all the rich rulers wanted them for their buildings. Phoenicians were masters of glassmaking and the manufacture of luxury and common goods. Expert sailors and innovative shipbuilders, purveyors of exotic goods from across the world, and masters of glass, these would have been enough to make the Phoenicians famous. But truly, it was in the making of selling of dye that they made their name. In ancient times, all the purple dye in all the world came from Phoenicia. They were the only ones with the know-how and the materials to make it. Purple dye was made in a long and stinky process of crushing and soaking and fermenting the murex snail. This process was so stinky that Tyre, the capital of Phoenicia, was famous for its stench. The process of making purple dye was not only lengthy and stinky, but it was also very labor and material intensive. It took over a thousand snails just to create enough dye for one cloak. This made purple dye exceedingly expensive, so expensive in fact, that for the most part, only royalty was able to afford it. And that is where we get the term royal purple. Now, last week, we talked about how during the Bronze Age collapse, literacy really took a hit in the Mediterranean. Some peoples, like the Mycenaeans, forgot entirely how to read and write and didn't get those skills back for centuries. However, that simply would not do for the Phoenicians. Remember, these were shrewd businessmen who traded across the Mediterranean. They had to be highly organized. They had to have ways to send and receive messages. They had to have ways to keep records of what they had bought and sold. 
In other words, they needed writing. And it's thanks to the Phoenicians and their need for a writing system and organization that writing reemerged in the ancient world. The Phoenician writing system was based on Egyptian hieroglyphs. What they did is they took Egyptian hieroglyphs, they simplified them, and then they used them to represent sounds in their own language. These sounds weren't syllables, they weren't entire words, they were consonants. In other words, the Phoenicians invented the first alphabet. An alphabet is a writing system where each symbol represents either a consonant or a vowel. The English language uses an alphabet. But one difference between the English alphabet and the Phoenician alphabet was that the Phoenician alphabet did not have any vowels in it, simply because the Phoenician language didn't have that many vowels. Whenever the Phoenicians wanted to write a word that had a vowel, they would just write down the consonants. And when you read the word, you would automatically mentally fill in what vowels were supposed to be there. I realize that sounds really difficult and confusing, but we can do that even in English to a certain extent. Take a look, for example, at this sentence. It's written in English, and I've taken out all the vowels. And yet, I bet everyone watching this can read this sentence. John likes books. The Phoenicians weren't the only ones who found having a writing system useful. And since they traded across the known world, it wasn't long before other cultures began adopting the Phoenician alphabet and adapting it to fit their own languages. One of these peoples was the Greeks. And that is how the Greeks learned again to write. Just as the Phoenicians created the first alphabet by simplifying Egyptian hieroglyphs, so the Greeks adopted the Phoenician alphabet, added vowels, and otherwise changed it to fit their own writing style and language. The Romans later adopted the Greek alphabet, changed it a bit to fit their language, and then passed it down to us. We added a few letters to the Roman alphabet, but otherwise kept it the same. And so you can thank the Phoenicians, the Greeks, and the Romans for the way that we read and write today. The Phoenicians, of course, primarily used their writing for trade, but the Greeks saw a different use for it, and they focused on writing literature. Greece had a long tradition of epic poetry. During the Greek Dark Ages, stories were kept alive through oral tradition, storytellers memorizing long poems and passing them down generation to generation. These storytellers had the ability to memorize immense quantities of material. Modern 20th century storytellers in Africa have found to have memorized 55,000 lines of poetry. The two most famous Greek poems are the Iliad and the Odyssey, which were written down by the Greek poet Homer in the 8th century BC. The Iliad spins the tale of the ten-year war between Greece and Troy, a war begun by theft and ended by trickery. The war started when the Trojan Paris stole the most beautiful woman in the world, Helen, the wife of Greek king Menelaus. It ended when the Trojans were ambushed at night by Greek soldiers who had been smuggled between the high walls of the city in the belly of a wooden horse. The Greeks burnt Troy to the ground. But the war would not end so soon for the mastermind behind the wooden horse, Odysseus. It would take Odysseus another 10 years to make it back from the shores of Troy to his beloved Greece, and the Odyssey tells of his epic adventures on that voyage home. The Iliad and the Odyssey, these epic tales, were more than just a way to pass the time. They bound people together. Remember, at this period of time, the Greeks are still a medley of cultures. Homer's poems gave them a shared background to go along with their shared religion and language. They reminded them that whatever their differences of opinion, of culture, of governance, at the bottom of it, when push came to shove, they were one people, the Greeks. Next week, we'll be voyaging to Israel to look at a very different people as we explore David, Solomon, and the split. See you next week.